So we're finally getting around to updating the computers here in the studio. And after what seemed like an eternity of time has passed, we finally got the M2 Pro and the M1 Max here in studio. Now the M2 Pro chipset is the newest and fastest out, so that ought to easily be able to beat out the M1 Max. And we wanna find out which computer works for our overall workflow here at the studio the best. Let's check it out. Hey guys, it's Steve from Featherlight Studio, and in this video, we're gonna be looking at how the M2 Pro stacks up against the M1 Max Studio. And the reason why is because after doing all the research that we did online and all of the reading and forums and YouTube and everything, it still wasn't a clear choice by any stretch. If, if people had an M2 Pro, they said that was the best machine they've ever used. If they had an M1 Max Studio, they said that was the best machine they ever used. And it was a really complex topic to get any real solid information on. Now, I don't wanna start an M2 Pro versus M1 Studio flame war, but I do wanna get down to which works better for our overall workflow. And I can tell you that just stacking a bunch of plugins on top of one another is not a very accurate indication of how either machine's gonna behave in your particular circumstance. In ours, for example, in a production and deadline-based environment where stuff's getting pushed all the time, we need to know exactly how both machines are gonna behave. And not just for audio, but for video as well. Anybody who says they're not doing any video isn't really looking at the big picture down the road because eventually you're probably gonna be doing video. We didn't think we would ever be doing video. We're a commercial recording studio and that's all we did for a long time but video has a way of sneaking into your work environment. And each new version of a DAW starts to tax the GPU related stuff more and more and more. We really saw that with Cubase in the early versions of Cubase, it wasn't taxing the graphical environment hardly at all, but now it has a lot more demands on that. And it has a lot to do with how smooth the program plays back. So all that stuff factors into it. So we wanna get down to which machine really behaves the best and also things like audio noise levels. We're gonna be using it in a critical listening environment. It has to be dead silent. So these are all important factors and that may or may not apply to you. Hopefully this information will be helpful. So let's dive in and find out which one is gonna be best suited for us. Our comparison is only for desktop systems here as we already have our screen and all of our peripherals, so we won't be including the new M2 Max chip found in the new MacBook Pros. And while there's already an overwhelming amount of info about how these chips compare with standard benchmarks, we're a lot more interested in how they compare with heavy real-world audio and video projects. We started with a custom configuration of the Mac Studio with the things we needed most, the 32-core GPU, 32 gigs of unified memory was fine for us. And in both these systems, we really wanted to upgrade to a one terabyte system drive just for some space. Then we did the same configuration with the M2 Pro setup. We chose the most amount of GPUs, which was 19 in this case, 32 gig of unified memory, the one terabyte SSD, and then the 10 gigabit ethernet. All put us within about $100 of each configuration. After each configuration is finished, the M2 Pro has more CPU cores, but the M1 Max has more GPUs. GPU cores. The first test is a straight up ambient studio noise test with a microphone directly in front of each computer. And we're using the Shure KSM44 for its incredibly low noise floor. Both recordings are gonna be straight into the DAW with no post-processing of any kind. For each one of the tests, we have Cinebench R23 running full on on a multi-core process in the background for at least 10 minutes before we start recording the ambient noise floor of each one of the computers. This gives the computer time to get up to speed and to simulate a full stress environment before we begin recording the actual noise. Both machine backups are identical systems from a backup ISO that we use so that neither configuration has an advantage over the other when it comes to performance or the overall noise floor generated. With the situations reversed, we've powered down the M1 Max Studio system and we've moved the microphone directly in front of the Mac Mini M2 Pro system. Same test applies for the M2 Pro system. We have Cinebench R23 running full speed on a multi-core process in the background while we start the recording process in our DAW. In addition to capturing the noise floor on each one of these machines and running Cinebench in the background, we're also screen recording to give you an idea of the overall brute force and power of each one of these machines. And with both machines under extreme load, wide open, we get this.
Keep in mind here that these are negative numbers, so minus 41 dB is considerably quieter than minus 29 dB. So this was a bit of a surprise to us, although not unexpected if you consider the M1 Max Studio's overall thermal cooling compared to the M2. And while you might not have your ear as close to your workstation as we had this microphone, it gives you an overall idea of how these two machines are gonna behave in a quiet environment. This is a very big deal to us as we routinely deal with noise floor issues here in a recording studio. Next up, we're testing rendering times in a large real world project, well over 100 tracks with hundreds of plugins on all the buses, tracks, aux buses, and effects returns. We're also gonna be setting a very low overall system latency, which would normally be considerably higher, 1024 and up to help reduce the overall load on the system CPU. This is a typical project for us towards the middle or end stages of a mix where there's lots of plugins active, there's lots of different routing options going on at the same time, a lot of different automation, so a lot of unpredictable behavior here. This stresses all the components of a computer, including things like disk access, a lot more realistically, instead of just stacking a bunch of plugins in a linear fashion on top of each other. A typical project of this size with this many tracks and this many plugins would typically take around 20 minutes or so, depending on the length of the project on our old Intel-based studio computer, which was our our MacBook Pro. We'll use that as a comparison for these time renders. Our project render here on the M1 Mac Studio finishes up in just under two minutes and 37 seconds, which is a huge improvement over our previous system, so no complaints there. We've bundled up our project and transferred it over to our M2 Pro system, and we're gonna repeat the exact same tests under the exact same conditions. Here's where the extra muscle in the M2 Pro's extra CPU cores should really show a significant difference. And the M2 Pro edges out the M1 Mac Studio by finishing several seconds earlier. So the M2 Pro edges out the M1 Max, but not not by a great deal and not by nearly as much of a power scaling difference as we'd experienced in each one of our previous studio builds. That being said, at least where audio is concerned, neither system even came close to breaking a sweat even on our largest projects. In addition, both our M1 Max and M2 Pro systems ran at nearly identical latency settings inside our DAW, so neither machine had the advantage there. Nowadays, just about any modern day phone or tablet can easily edit 4K footage, and there is a wealth of applications out there designed to make that process easy for you. So simply lining up some clips of 4K footage and throwing a transition or two in there along with some film grain and a LUT isn't a challenge for either machine since they can both easily accomplish that. We need a real world test that involves a modern day video project. This is a much more typical modern day video project with many layers, titles, transitions, compound clips, and a project like this is a lot more likely to stress both machines under demanding conditions, especially if those conditions last for any length of time. In the video test here, we wanna be able to work at full resolution without having to work with proxies. And in addition, we're also gonna disable background rendering. We wanna be able to get a realistic view of what the footage is gonna look like at full resolution so that we can make those decisions without having to zoom in or using reduced resolution proxies. This will force both the M1 Mac Studio as well as the M2 Pro Mac Mini to render all of the changes, cuts, and transitions in real time. This will give us a much more realistic view of the processing power, especially on the video side, of both of these machines. Our first video test is gonna be on the M1 Max Studio system. As you can see, scrubbing the project cursor on our project here results in nice smooth playback. And as we zoom into the compound clip that we have here, we can see we have several different layers of audio as well as video. And as we back out of the compound clip and look at our regular project timeline, we start playback and we can see that we get nice smooth playback in the edit window at full resolution. Although on our cursor playback, you can see we're starting to get a little stuttered playback on that, but our preview window at full resolution is still nice and smooth. Now it's time to close down our Final Cut library and move it on over to our M2 Pro system and see if we can achieve similar playback results. And the next video test is gonna be on our M2 Pro Mac Mini system. As we hit playback, we can already see some problems starting to develop. We're getting some beach balling and we're getting some stuttering in the playback and the audio. The M2 Pro just doesn't seem to have enough actual graphical muscle to keep up with the playback. It gets it, but not for very long.
So the M2 Pro chipset really pulls its weight when it comes to the audio side of things, but when it comes to video, it just doesn't have the muscle to keep up with the N1 Mac Studio system, and you could reduce the resolution and work with proxies, but the whole point of this is to see how it works in the real world under pressure. So as you can see, both of these machines are just insanely powerful for the money. And Apple has spent a ton of time in finding out which demographic these machines are made for. And that might be different for you, or it might be different for other people you know. So finding out what these machines do specifically in your own workflow is the most important thing. Which demographic do you fall into? If you're looking to get the most amount of power there is possible out of every dollar, and without a doubt, the M2 Pro makes the most amount of sense because they pack the most amount of power into an incredibly affordable and portable machine. But as you saw, by the time you start specking one out close to the specs of an M1 Mac Studio, the Mac Studio starts to pull ahead. And when you get into heavy projects that involve video or a really graphic intensive environment, the Mac Studio pulls out way ahead. And we were more surprised than anybody so you gotta weigh those two factors out, but in our scenario, as you can see back there, the M1 Mac Studio is the one that's staying on the shelf. We're gonna send our little guy back. It's been a huge and powerful contender, but for our workflow, the M1 Mac Studio is gonna be a better overall fit for us. So hopefully this has been helpful in helping you decide and which one's gonna be better for your workflow. So if you learned something or if this was helpful in any way, please hit the subscription and notification bells. It really does help keep the channel going. It helps me make more videos like this. Thanks for hanging out with me today, you guys. Stay safe, be creative, add something creative to the world. It could really use it. Take care, we'll catch you guys in the next video.